Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the American Forest Foundation, the incredible edible ostrich fern fiddlehead webinar. During your presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during your presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded September 3rd, 2014. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mackenzie Rockless, American Tree Farm Systems. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. This is Mackenzie from the American Tree Farm System. I know some of you have come to us through extension, so welcome to our landowner webinar series. This fall, we're doing a big series in cooperation with the National Institute for Food and Agriculture, um, the National Agroforestry Center, and the USDA Forest Service, as well as the Extension's Forest Farming Community of Practice. So all these great people have come together to help me out and to find these wonderful speakers like David Fuller. Um, and he will be speaking to us about the incredible edible ostrich fern fiddlehead, and some of you that might have received an email from me know that I need this webinar as much as anyone else because I picked the wrong picture for my email. Um, it was just a pretty picture that I had taken, and I thought, oh, this will be great, and then was immediately informed. So some of you know your fiddleheads because you told me <laughs> that was not it. But hopefully by the end of this, we'll all know which things we can eat and which we can't. Um, if you don't know anything about the American Tree Farm System, it's the largest and oldest sustainable woodland system in America. We work to give our tree farmers the tools they need to be effective stewards of America's natural, natural heritage, but really we're just supportive of sustainable forestry in general, so we welcome all to our educational series. Um, as he said, the chat is in the bottom left, and so I'll be responding to the chat there. David will respond to questions as he can, but probably mostly at the end. Um, and if you have any audio problems today, um, we can try to work that out for you. A lot of times it's just connection because this is coming over the Internet, so refreshing your browser might help. Um, and you, after this, you will receive the slides and um, a recording. And if you're interested in SAF um, CFE credits, those will be registered about a month from now because you can watch the webinar for credits for about a month. And now, we will turn things over to Mr. David Fuller, agriculture and Agricultural and Non-Timber Forest Products Professional from the University of Maine and Cooperative Extension. Take it away. Well, thanks a lot, Mackenzie, and I'm uh, glad to be here, and thanks for so many people for, uh, for being here with us today. Um, uh, I've been with the University of Maine Cooperative Extension for about 16 years now, and um, working with uh, agriculture, and then uh, probably in the last 12 years a lot with non-timber forest products. And I work with folks to help supplement uh, incomes from uh, their small woodlots, and Maine has a lot of small woodlot owners. Um, and so uh, the, uh, the non-timber forest products would include uh, ostrich fern fiddleheads, and I've been doing some work in that research-wise in the last few years, and really uh, look forward to sharing that with you. Um, so uh, this is a, a shot that was showed up in the Bangor Daily from a, a project we were working on this spring and with some uh, unfurled ostrich ferns there in the foreground. So today's objectives, I want to talk about uh, just an overview of fiddleheads and, and I'm talking only about ostrich fern fiddleheads today uh, and there's a few important reasons for that which I'll get to a little bit. Um, if you do have questions, uh, it would be great uh, uh, for the flow of the uh, program, if you could wait till the end, I may have answered the questions, and um, it's going to be tough for me to juggle, I think, the questions in the chat box here. Um, so that would be great if you could. So we're going to talk uh, about an overview of fiddleheads for those of you who don't know what they are, and this may serve as a refresher with uh, perhaps some new information for those of you who do know your fiddle ostrich fern fiddleheads. We're going to learn how to identify them. Um, as they're coming from the ground primarily, not the, uh, not the mature fern, although I'll uh, talk a little bit about that as well too. Uh, seeing as how most ostrich fern fiddleheads are, sustain, uh, are wild harvested, I'm going to talk about what constitutes a sustainable harvest from research we've done. Fiddlehead food safety is an important topic as, uh, as fiddleheads are frequently in river floodplains, so um, I'll talk about the obvious need for uh, food safety in terms of cooking there. 
And then lastly, um, and we're really in the infancy here, uh, there is no commercial uh, production of fiddleheads in the United States that I'm aware of for, for consumption. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, planting ostrich ferns. So getting to the fern itself, you can see it's got a really, really wide distribution. And um, they're very, very popular in uh, the New England states and uh, New Brunswick. And I can't say for the rest of, uh, of the uh, continent, but um, they're, they're really widespread. They're going way north and, and further south uh, 10 years ago than I had thought of. Uh, so they really have quite a wide distribution. Uh, in terms of the biology, the Latin name for uh, ostrich fern is Matuccia struthiopterus, rather. Uh, it was named for a, an Italian fellow, um, Carlo Matucci. Um, and Struthiopteris is referring to uh, appearing like an ostrich feather. So, um, and the Latin names are important because you can talk about this all around the world and you're all talking about the same fern. And that's important with fiddleheads because it frequently becomes confusing as to what is a fiddlehead. So again, we're talking about ostrich fern fiddleheads here. Ostrich ferns are an herbaceous perennial, which means that they die back to the ground every year. Um, it's uh, perennial, it will come up again the next year and they live uh, quite a while, uh, but unlike some ferns which stay green all, all year round, uh, even beneath the snow, these do die back to the ground. They spread by rhizomes, which are an underground stem, and uh, occasionally by spores, but primarily by rhizomes. Uh, it's a, and it's an assertive fern. Uh, meaning that it pushes itself around once it gets in a, in a spot and it's happy, it, it moves around quite a bit. I know people who have planted it in the home landscape and it kind of moves into the lawn, but you can control it by harvesting it very heavily or, or mowing if it gets too, too far out of control. Um, it's widely adapted from zones three to six and uh, some say a little bit uh, more into seven. Um, and above all, it's a sustainable resource if it's harvested correctly, and I'll spend quite a bit of time on that topic. As a, as a springtime green, it's long sought after. It's a very, very popular um, uh, with uh, the Penobscots, uh, the four tribes in Maine, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq. Uh, very, very popular. It has been for thousands of years. Um, recently, Canadian uh, research has found it to be a source of omega-3 fatty acids, which is a real good health, health thing. Uh, so also a source of fiber, vitamin C, vitamin A. And I have the sources at the uh, foot of the slide there uh, where that research came from. And uh, people will ask me, well, what's a fiddlehead taste like anyhow? And it's like, hmm, it's hard to describe that one. It really has a taste all of its own. Some people say it's a little bit like asparagus, but it's, uh, it's got its own taste. It's a little wild tasting, maybe uh, like venison as compared to beef or something like that. So it's, uh, it's pretty popular. I know that. Um, in terms of uh, the culture in the Northeast, they're very, very popular. This is a birch bark uh, basket uh, that was uh, made about uh, 1795. It's incised. This is a winter bark. And what they did was to scrape away the design and um, the outer bark. And this uh, double curve motif is very popular amongst the Northeast uh, Native Americans, uh, strongly reminiscent of a fiddlehead. This is a uh, interstate marker in New Brunswick where fiddleheads are, are really, really strong. And so they have this fiddlehead trail up there. And so you see this on the, on the markers. Um, in Farmington at the University of Maine in Farmington, this is a, uh, a hand railing end in the shape of a fiddlehead. So there, it's a very popular kind of thing, and it's, it's in nature in terms of spirals here and there, and, uh, and people really like the design uh, quite a bit. We've, uh, we had our third uh, annual Fiddlehead Festival and Local Food Day at uh, Farmington. So it's uh, showing what a part of culture it is. We had a really, really good turnout. It was a fun day. We had a lot of music and whatnot. And there's a, um, there's a website there on that slide uh, that you can go in and, and check on, um, check on what, uh, what was going on that day. We have a bunch of classes. I uh, teach a couple of classes about fiddlehead um, identification. We actually go out into the field. And uh, so that's very helpful for folks. 
And I hope by the end of the uh, slideshow here that you'll be able to identify uh, ostrichur and fiddleheads with no problem. A sign of spring in Maine. Yes, indeed. The fiddlehead uh, uh, vendors show up in all sorts of fashions. A lot of them are self-serving uh, stands. So you just um, take your quart of fiddleheads and put your money in the box. Uh, and these pop up like lemonade stands all over the state. Um, starts uh, early in May uh, down in the southern part of the state, and then the fiddleheads are still being picked in the northern part of Maine because we're, we uh, extend quite a bit north to south uh, at the end, um, well, up till the middle of June. And this is, is a, a sign from another uh, roadside stand. So you can see the prices. Um, this is the, probably the lowest price I've seen lately, and this is, this is a price from probably 20 years ago. Um, and then it ranges um, quite widely. Uh, this is on the west coast, and they call this uh, a conventional uh, crop, which means it was wild harvested. And most of the fiddleheads that you do find in the market, um, hazarding a guess of 99.9% .9 are wild harvested and uh, probably don't come commercial plantings. They're very good in uh, pickled uh, as fiddleheads, and we do have a recipe in one of our publications that I'll uh, be making reference to uh, upcoming. Uh, the uh, fiddlehead raviolis were being served at the uh, Fiddlehead Festival this year, and, and they were an excellent, uh, excellent thing. I froze, froze them up and had them a little bit later in the season when the pole beans and the cucumbers were coming in, so that's, uh, it was a nice dish. But I think most, most folks in Maine, anyhow, uh, that I know, just, they just boil the steam them uh, with a little salt, pepper, maybe a little bit of vinegar, and uh, some butter, and, uh, and, they, and they're pretty good. So going through the uh, life stages of the fiddlehead, uh, these are some that are newly emerging in the spring. You can see the crown, and I'll use the pointer here. This is the whole crown here, and then the fiddleheads are emerging just in the center here. We have the uh, last year's fiddlehead fern uh, the stems are still here, which helps to identify them because they have this deep U-shaped groove here. And then um, later on, this is about the time at which to pick. Um, you can actually harvest the fiddleheads with the stem, and you just snap them off with your fingers. Uh, we don't encourage folks to cut them with knives because you may uh, injure these uh, remaining fiddleheads. So this is about the time to harvest, and they're very good with the stems. You don't need to pick just the fiddlehead itself at the top. Um, so you, you can pick two or three inches of the stem. And then beyond that, uh, they're really, they've gotten away. Um, this, uh, the one here on the right, you see, is starting to come unfurled. This is not marketable anymore, and folks don't eat these at this stage. Uh, this one in here in the middle uh, would be still good, and this one's kind of getting, getting by. The, the problem with the ones that have become unfurled is they, uh, they really don't keep well at all. They just start wilting, and uh, the ones like this, uh, that are harvested will keep for a long time. Uh, after you've washed them, put them in a the fridge, they'll keep at least for a couple of weeks. So they, they store very well. So this is a, um, this is a crown of fiddleheads. And here we have um, some that are really starting to come unfurled. Um, and then some that are still harvestable here at the base. And I'll talk about sustainable harvest. But you see these little brown uh, parchment-like wrappers on, and as the ferns elongate, that falls off. But this, when they're first coming up, is one way to identify the fiddlehead, ostrich fern fiddleheads. And then you've got here, the structure is called a, a fertile frond, and spores are, are born on this, and that's one way that ostrich ferns can multiply, uh, but it's not the predominant way. And these will stay up for a, a year or more after they've come up. And not all plants will have these, uh, so it's not always a reliable uh, uh, means of identification. This is a close-up of the fertile frond, and so the, uh, the spores are, are born uh, in here by the gazillions. They're very, very plentiful. And then in the wintertime, uh, it's actually a way of finding fiddlehead grounds. If you want to go out on uh, snowshoes and go wandering around on the snow, you'll see these fertile fronds are still sticking up. And they kind of look like an ostrich, uh, ostrich feather a little bit as well, too. 
and again, they'll stay up for a long time. Uh, but if you're into uh, other uses of non-timber forest products, these are, uh, look very nice in floral arrangements, um, uh, particularly in the fall because they're brown maybe for Thanksgiving arrangements and things like that. But I do know people who uh, actually spray paint them too, um, and so they can use them at, at different times. Um, so in Maine, it's just an estimate, but we figured we harvest about 100,000 pounds of fiddleheads a year in neighboring New Brunswick, uh, really, which is the very much the same forest type as Maine. Uh, if you cross the border, it looks just like Maine, not, not really any difference. They harvest at least four times that amount every year, and they have a, a large processor um, just outside of uh, New Brunswick. Um, so uh, it's, it's a big, big business in New Brunswick. So a little bit more about the plant. Uh, this is showing some of the anatomy of the plant. Here you've got a, a young fern plant with really young ones here, which probably are uh, the result of an underground rhizome coming out here. But this really illustrates well how vigorous they can be in terms of spreading. And so what will happen here is this tip will pop up above ground, and then you'll have a new fern plant, which in oh, probably a couple of three years is going to look like this fern here. A close-up of the base of a fern plant showing the rhizomes. And so we've got one here, uh, maybe another one down below here, a third, and yet a fourth starting up here. So this is a young fern plant, uh, very happy, very, uh, very aggressive in terms of, uh, of uh, getting itself established and, and making more fern plants. And so this is a, uh, this is a single fern that's connected by rhizomes. Um, the way this plant started was from the mother fern here, and you can see it's got this great big crown, and as the ferns age, they actually push themselves up above ground. So this, uh, may, this crown may be sticking six inches above the soil, and it is, um, as time goes by, it makes itself very predisposed towards uh, cold winters where we have no snow cover. A fern like this might survive, but a fern like this sticking above ground may not survive. So this was the first fern that got started. Uh, looking at this, I would say that this was probably the second one that got started just by the size. And when we're looking at harvesting, we could harvest half of these fiddleheads or less a year. That would be sustainable. And then this one here, we could pick, uh, it's a little hard to tell how many there are going to be there, maybe four or five, and we could pick a couple of those probably. probably. This one, obviously, we're not going to pick anything from. It's dead now. Um, but this fern here is very uh, small, relatively speaking. The fiddleheads are small. Okay, compare that to these over here. Okay, so we'll leave this fern alone. Probably won't harvest anything from that for a couple of years because um, the ferns need the fiddleheads to, uh, to regenerate and to produce food uh, for the next year's fiddlehead. So if you pick them when they're too small, it may damage or uh, possibly even kill the fern. And this is a cross-section, uh, very interesting of what the uh, ostrich fern looks like inside the crown. These are this year's fiddleheads. Uh, were we to pick all of these, it may actually release a couple of quote-unquote next year's fiddleheads, which you don't want to do. Uh, so uh, just harvest half or less, and, and that should provide uh, an ongoing uh, supply of fiddleheads for, for subsequent years. Uh, and this is a mature fiddlehead fern. Um, you see it tapers uh, both at the top and at the bottom, and its widest most part is, is up near the top here. Uh, it's just a single, um, single uh, stem when it comes out of the soil. It doesn't branch. It just, um, it's, a, it's a fairly simple looking, quite elegant in the landscape, and it's very popular as a landscape plant. And I wonder how many people don't know that you can actually eat the, the fiddleheads from that. Um, ostrich fern fiddleheads are subject to uh, frost damage. Uh, when it gets down maybe 28 degrees or something like that, you can see this one is, is entirely dead. The one here, you can see the frost damage where it's kind of turned brown a little bit. But later emerging fiddleheads are fine. So they were spared from that because they were down deep down in the crown. So they, um, you can have some problems sometimes with, uh, with frost. And the, so the later some of these uh, some of the fiddleheads actually come up quite a bit later, and those are, that's advantageous for their survival. Okay, so 
when we're talking about fiddleheads, there are other ferns that have fiddleheads. Uh, I think Mackenzie made reference to one that she had a picture of. So there, any number of ferns do have fiddleheads, but uh, I want to emphasize that we want to eat the ostrich fern fiddlehead uh, because that's the one that we know the most about. Um, there's another one called the bracken fern. We do know that's a bad one, so uh, that's a good one to avoid. So other ferns have fiddleheads that come up in the spring. Uh, but uh, the bracken fern, for example, is, is carcinogenic under lab conditions. Um, and uh, so what does a bracken fern look like? So you can see uh, from the other fiddlehead pictures that we've had, this one looks remarkably different. And that's easy in terms of making identification. First of all, it's kind of fuzzy. It's gray almost in color. And it has what looks like curled up bird, bird claws or something here. That's because when this fern emerges, it doesn't have a single, uh, a single branch, but it has uh, typically three, two or three branches. Um, and, so, and this is a reference for, that, um, for the uh, research which showed that uh, the bracken fern was carcinogenic to rats. Uh, and it also showed that ostrich fern fiddleheads were not, car uh, were not carcinogenic or toxic. So. OK, a close-up, side-by-side, um, gray, fuzzy, looks like bird feet here, dark green, smooth, no fuzz. Um, you have this brown parchment-like covering, and then this uh, deep U groove here. So it's a very, very distinguishable. And there's no other fern that looks quite like the ostrich fern fiddlehead, too. So you don't really need to know all the other ferns. You just need to know the characteristics of the ostrich fern, and then it's um, it just makes it a lot easier. And then once you know where a patch is in your landscape or with permission to harvest from someone else, uh, the patch is there. And kind of like a, kind of like a trout uh, fishing hole, you would never tell anyone where your, where your patch was, of course. So just a little uh, uh, identification wrap up. Uh, so ostrich fern fiddleheads are green in color. They have a smooth stem. Uh, it's kind of almost shiny. It's not uh, furry or hairy. It has a deep U-shaped groove on the inside of the stem. Uh, it has a parchment-like uh, covering, uh, kind of papery covering. When it first comes up, uh, and then as it elongates a little bit, it quickly falls off. And you do want to remove uh, that papery covering before you eat because it's, it's uh, probably high in tannins or something. It's fairly bitter. Uh, and it'll turn the water uh, that you're boiling in uh, really, really dark colored. You can either do it dry. Uh, some people uh, will just kind of rub it, uh, the fiddleheads be between their hands. And you could um, actually do this in front of a fan, and it'll help to blow the parchment away. Other people will wash, but sometimes it'll take quite a few washings before you get all of that parchment um, uh, washed away. And then um, the last thing is, is that uh, sometimes uh, you'll have fertile fronds uh, that will last for a year or more. And not all the plants will have those, but in a given stand of ferns, uh, you should be seeing some of those belonging to ostrich ferns. And then a pictorial um, wrap-up on ID, the rich green color. I call it vibrant. Um, the uh, paper covering, smooth stem. You want to harvest it before it elongates and these leaves start developing. A deep U-shaped groove. And the uh, fertile frond also has a d deep U-shaped groove on the inside of the stem, too. So when are they ready to harvest? Um, that's always a, a, a topic of uh, discussion in, in my neck of the woods. People saying, well, the fiddlehead's ready. And I don't know. I haven't gone out to check them. So I started doing a phenological study uh, using blooming uh, plant indicators, so when they might be ready. And this is just a generalization uh, because uh, most of these plants have uh, new, improved varieties that bloom over a wider period of time. But we're looking at forsythias. Um, as a rough indicator, daffodils, daffodils will bloom for a long time. So once they start blooming, it might be time to go out and check your, your, um, your patch. Uh, black cherry, service berry, amelanchier. Um, and then some wildflowers, and uh, depending on where you are, and this I, I have to emphasize is from a main perspective. Uh, that's where most of my experience is. So, uh, but you may have some of these wildflowers too because their distribution is quite widespread. And some of those wildflowers, um, a trout lily is one. Uh, when that's blooming, it's pretty much fiddlehead time. Bloodroot. 
and blood roots famous for blooming for about three days and then all the petals fall off and you can see some of the petals here in the litter and this, this blossom has fallen apart. Uh, a real spring ephemeral in terms of its blossom. It doesn't last very long. Another one is uh, red trillium and locally we call this thinking Benjamin because its blossom has a fetid smell which attracts the pollinators. Uh, it's also called wake robin. It's a, that's an old old name for it. So those are some of the wildflowers that would indicate the fiddleheads might be ready. So now we've looked, taken a look at what fiddleheads look like and whatnot. The, the all essential question is how do we harvest them sustainably and what does that look like? So this is, uh, this is a good illustration of what not to do. Uh, all the fiddleheads in this, uh, on this crown were harvested. And we had one, two, three, four, five, six, all were harvested. And in this clump, uh, this crown looks pretty, pretty uh, healthy and whatnot. I would have harvested no more than three. Um, and I'll uh, tie that in with the, the research um, uh, that I did here in a little bit. But uh, the idea is that you need to leave some behind. Otherwise, there's going to be nothing there to produce food for that crown. And the crown will get smaller over time. And if you harvest it every year, um, it, may, it may wind up killing it. And this is more of what I see in Maine now. It's, um, I know uh, folks uh, anecdotally uh, have fiddlehead patches out in the back of the house and uh, commercial folks will come in and harvest them so that landowners uh, are not able to harvest their fiddleheads from their own land. So that's starting to really rankle people, rightfully so. so um, and most of the land in Maine is privately owned. It's not uh, owned by the state or um, or, uh, or the federal system, it's, uh, it's almost entirely uh, privately owned. And we take pride in, in being sharing with our neighbors and whatnot, but that's obviously uh, can, be, can be overdone. Um, during the uh, recent uh, economic hard times, fiddleheads and other non-timber forest products frequently are fallen back on in terms of a uh, um, uh, source of uh, quick cash. So. Um, I try to educate in, uh, folks in terms of how to, how to harvest so, so we can avoid uh, posting of land and whatnot. So the research um, that the um, University of Maine Cooperative Extension did was based on the central question, um, and what is the effect of harvesting on fiddleheads? Because people go back every year and harvest in the same spot. So um, some of the other studies that were out there were based on uh, one-year studies or plants, uh, ferns were dug up and brought into a greenhouse. Uh, they weren't really simulating what was happening out in nature. So what happens if you pick uh, fiddleheads for three years? So in this experiment design, uh, we wanted to simulate what uh, folks were actually doing. And most of the harvesters I know uh, fall into two schools. They say, well, you have to leave some, otherwise there'll be nothing left to pick in years to come. And then the other folks say, well, look, it's like asparagus. You can pick it and pick it and pick it, and nothing ever happens. And I want to emphasize that ostrich ferns are absolutely not like asparagus uh, that you can pick for about six weeks once the uh, patch is well established. Not, not, not at all the same kind of plant. So. And then the challenge for this experiment was to conduct it where it wouldn't be disturbed, uh, knowing in Maine if there's a patch of fiddleheads, it's, it's kind of there for the taking if you have permission or, or sometimes not. Um, I had to find it in a secluded place and get the landowner permission and then uh, have, uh, have them not harvest the fiddleheads uh, himself, which is quite a sacrifice. But he had other patches of fiddleheads to harvest. So. Uh, the uh, experiment design was um, harvest no more than one, uh, one half from one plant. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got to go back to the slide, uh, slide previous. So what I found was that um, I had three, three um, uh, sets of plants. One was a control where I didn't harvest any at all. And then uh, the uh, second set of plants, I harvested half the fiddleheads that came up. Uh, at one time with no subsequent harvest uh, because late fiddleheads will sometimes break. And then the third plot where uh, fiddleheads were harvest all of them, uh, harvested all of them. And um, as a result of that um, work, I found that the fiddleheads that were harvested entirely for three consecutive years, uh, about three quarters of them uh, did die. Um, so it's their, um, they started going downhill after the second picking and by 
The third picking, about three quarters of them are dead. So it's, uh, they really go downhill very fast. And above all, don't pick any more that may come up later in the year. Okay, uh, you should harvest just one time. And if you see that someone else has been picking ahead of you, you should not uh, pick after them. Don't assume that, well, I can pick a couple more. Uh, it's, it's probably not okay. Avoid picking from small plants. These are plants that, uh, remember our rhizome picture? Okay, so these are young plants, so they're just trying to get established. Uh, they could be very old plants as well, too. Um, and the small plants just don't have much vigor, so they don't, they don't hold up to picking very well at all. So avoid picking those. And uh, one inch diameter or less fiddleheads, so leave those alone. That's about the size of a quarter. Don't harvest from plants with only two or three fiddleheads. Um, those, are, those are probably the, the young ones. They should have four or more before you really start picking them. And the bigger plants, the better. The bigger the fiddlehead, the more vigorous that fern is and the more able it is to withstand harvest. And again, don't, uh, don't uh, use a knife because you may damage the rest of the crown. Just um, snap it off uh, with your fingers. So if wild harvesting, uh, first of all, is to get landowner permission. Uh, and I can't emphasize that enough. Um, in Maine, uh, you can go to the local town office, um, identify clearly where the property is on a, on a local map or gazetteer or something like that, and they can give you the landowner's um, uh, name at least, and then it's up to you to uh, figure out how to get a hold of them, uh, especially if they're absentee, uh, which is uh, quite often the case in Maine and rural areas. Uh, so make sure that you have permission, properly identify the fiddlehead. Uh, make sure it's an ostrich fern fiddlehead. And above all, don't over-harvest. Um, I made reference to this uh, earlier on. When we're picking fiddleheads, um, we have to be aware of food safety. Uh, and that goes uh, two ways in terms of when you're picking. Uh, just to use common sense, use a clean container, not an old used um, sheetrock mud bucket or something like that. Uh, washed hands. Clean the fiddleheads in potable water back home. Do, do not wash them off in the stream. Uh, and that's just common sense as well, too. This is no stream that's safe to drink from. Um, and then uh, wash and keep refrigerated um, as soon as you get home. Uh, they don't benefit from sitting in the car while you go out to lunch with the windows up. In those spring days, it can get pretty hot inside the car. And then uh, really uh, make sure that you cook them properly. And I'll get more on to uh, what constitutes uh, safe cooking. And some of the reasons that we're concerned with, uh, with food safety, um, earlier on you saw the sign, um, notice no commercial fiddlehead harvesting. Well, this is what it looked like this spring. Um, and uh, we had quite a flood where the water came up about four feet. Um, and this is what it looked like. Uh, these are the fiddlehead crowns. These are some uh, good examples of older plants, and they're uh, kind of rising up into a hummock. But these were actually underwater by several feet, and then the water receded and left this sheet of ice here. It was, it was kind of attractive in a, in a certain kind of way. But And then when the fiddleheads come up, they have been submerged by water, which has come down from the river or stream. In this case, it was the Sandy River. And you can see the sediment that's deposited on this, uh, on this weedy uh, leaf here. And so you don't really see it on the fiddleheads, but yet they've been, they've been uh, washed over uh, by, by river water. So uh, forgive the uh, text dense slide here, but this is from our fact sheet, Facts on Fiddleheads. And I have... Um, uh, uh, a resource slide later on which makes reference to that. But uh, suffice it to say, I'll just narrate here a little bit from the slide, that uh, there have been uh, outbreaks of food-borne uh, uh, related illness relating to uh, fiddleheads. Um, they are citing 1994 here, but uh, both in Canada and the United States, uh, the Center for Disease Control keeps track of that, and there have been uh, more outbreaks other than just 1994, suffice it to say. And so the uh, symptoms are fairly classic uh, food, poison, food poisoning related uh, symptoms, pretty, uh, pretty upset stomach. Um, so we want to avoid that uh, at, all, at all costs. Um, so in cooking fiddleheads, we recommend, uh, our food uh, science people only recommend two different ways. Um, boiling 
And so to boil fiddleheads, uh, to uh, immerse them after you've uh, cleaned all the uh, parchment uh, paper off them, all the brown little wrappers. Um, so you get the water boiling and uh, dump in your fiddleheads, bring it back to a boil, then start your timer. Okay, and then for steaming, it's a little less, uh, less time-wise, uh, and the parameters are for 10 to 12 minutes of uh, steaming. If you want to use fiddleheads in a stir fryer or something like that, do not try to cook them uh, from scratch uh, like you would a, oh, a bok choy or something like that. They shouldn't be crisp. Uh, they shouldn't be crisp tender, um, any of those other adjectives. They need to be well done. They're going to be tender. Uh, the, uh, some people say, well, they're, they're kind of mushy, but um, uh, they, the flavor really holds up. Uh, the texture may not be uh, quite what you imagine from a from a fresh veggie, but uh, so uh, make sure that you do cook them properly, and then you can just toss them in your stir fry at the last minute. They just to, like turn them a couple of times uh, without beating them up too badly, and that works out pretty well. So the question is: Is do we harvest wild or do we plant? Um, so some of the questions around that, well, in Maine there are no commercial plantings that I'm aware of uh, for, uh, for eating. Um, there are some home garden plantings that I know, and we'll have some slides of those coming up. Uh, in New Brunswick, um, Brian Dykeman, amongst others, did a number of experiments uh, and work uh, on fiddleheads in New Brunswick back in the 80s. Um, and I, I remember one of the papers saying that they predicted widespread plantings uh, within 10 years. But um, that doesn't seem to be the case uh, when I... Uh, when I talked with uh, folks up in New Brunswick, they said, no, it's not really the case. There's only maybe some quarter acre patches, which will produce a whole lot of fiddleheads, by the way. Um, and one of the reasons seems to be that the native populations are holding up of ostrich ferns. Uh, so it does cost quite a bit to, um, to get a planting going. And the payback's quite slow. You may not be able to harvest for like five years or something like that. So it's not really taken off yet. Uh, I suspect that it may pick up speed as time goes by, as local food uh, gets to be more and more important and people discover the taste of fiddleheads and the health benefits because they are, they are pretty good for you. Um, so, but when we're looking at wild harvesting, we have the question of accessibility of the ferns, and that's uh, landowner permission. Um, and not too remote because some of our rivers are, are extremely remote and you just can't get in and get out uh, easily. You may have to canoe up river for miles to get to where you're going and then you've got to easily get them out the market so it, it could be hours away. So that's, that presents a challenge and uh, is one, maybe one reason to plant. Uh, and then the timing. Uh, fiddleheads can grow several inches in a day, so you need to kind of be on top of them in terms of when they're coming up. They don't all come up at once, thankfully, so you can still uh, harvest, but uh, boy, they really grow fast and sometimes they'll get away from you. Um, wild harvesting, you know, it's, we can continue doing it if people don't harvest too much, but uh, uh, that's, that's one of the concerns uh, we have. And, and, you know, can the supply uh, keep up with the demand? Uh, it's being promoted fairly heavily uh, by one company in, um, up in, I think it's Quebec, um, and so uh, they, where they instant quick freeze fiddleheads. Uh, so that may uh, increase the demand for fiddleheads. So the current scene in Maine is, uh, you know, we've got a long, long tradition of wild harvesting. Uh, everyone talks about catching that first trout and getting their first mess of fiddleheads to eat, so it's, um, it's been going on for a long time. Um, increased interest in, in, the, in the local and the wild foods, the wild foods especially too. Um, and we've had recently a couple of bills that have come before the legislature. The first one was regarding um, requiring a, a law requiring that you have to have written permission to harvest uh, fiddleheads or uh, mushrooms, but then that was uh, then changed to a second bill to include all natural resources from private lands. And neither of those bills went through, although I suspect that um, it's going to come back in, a, in, another, uh, in another form. So change is kind of coming that way, um, and maybe it's, uh, maybe it's time to start planting. Um, so with your own patch, um, if you have the right uh, conditions, and I'll talk some more about that, the plant sources, um, there's two basic sources. You can uh, harvest with permission uh, from the wild, or maybe you have some fiddleheads on your property and you could uh, put them in new places, perhaps where they'll grow a little bit better. 
Um, and nursery sources are, are a second, uh, second option. Although if you're only buying a few plants, uh, I did a quick uh, bit of research and I found a lot of them are for a one quart size container, they're around $12, which is pretty pricey to get some fiddleheads going. So, And then it's going to take a, a number of years. Depending on the size of your stock, uh, if you, um, some fiddleheads are very, very small. I suspect that they're propagated via tissue culture, which is a really good and fast way uh, to uh, propagate plants, but they're very small, so it may be five, seven years before they'll be big enough. Um, and uh, like uh, comparing to asparagus, if you have bigger stock of um, uh, ostrich ferns, it may only take maybe three years like asparagus before they're ready to harvest. So characteristics of good fiddlehead ground, uh, under a, uh, a hardwood canopy. Uh, they don't really grow, not often seen underneath conifers, um, evergreens. So um, in Maine, they grow especially well under maples. In the river floodplains, uh, they're under frequently silver maples, uh, sometimes red maples, uh, ash, white and brown ash or black ash. Uh, and characteristics are very little uh, mid or understory. Uh, it's really pretty much the fiddleheads and then maybe some branches 30, 40, 50 feet above. So it's dappled sunlight. Um, adequate moisture, but not all season wet. They can actually do very well being underwater for a brief period of time, a couple of three days, uh, but not wet all summer long. The, the ground might be moist, but it is not wet. And fiddleheads uh, do best in shade. Uh, dappled light, uh, the research is say 30 to 40 percent, but dappled light um, works pretty well. If it's too heavy shade, they won't grow well either. For soil, we're looking for uh, good organic matter, and for those of you who soil test, it's probably a good idea to do that. Uh, typically, your local uh, cooperative extension uh, office uh, can give you directions on how to do a soil test, a complete one that will measure organic matter levels uh, like you might do for your garden. Um, they grow well on sandy or silt loams that are kind of well drained, uh, not too heavy in clay. They don't like a wet, sodden, heavy soil. Um, pH range pretty wide of um, 5 to 7, so um, uh, 7 is neutral, so a little acid. Um, so, and the soil should have the ability to drain, or the site should be such that uh, the water drains, uh, but not excessive drain, drainage like it might be on gravel or something like that. Again, moist soil is okay, wet is not, shouldn't be wet all the time. So this is a natural stand of uh, ostrich fern fiddleheads covering acres uh, in Maine, and uh, this is a uh, overstory of silver maples does really well, and you really see nothing else other than ferns in the understory. Um, so it's, um, that's a really, really happy, happy patch there that doesn't get harvested. Um, and so this is a planting, and this is from a little bit of a distance, so you can see what the um, surrounding uh, plant types are like. You've got some sugar maples and red maples, and uh, one lone pine here, which just happened to be there. It's not typical, but uh, the landowner planted these in the 80s. Uh, he planted about uh, 15 plants, as I recall, and, uh, and uh, currently there's probably numbers, so about six, 600 uh, crowns in there now. And then this is a close-up of what that planting looks like. Uh, so it could be improved a little bit through uh, weeding, perhaps, but it's pretty much... Uh, just ostrich ferns, and you see there, they look really, really beautiful, kind of these long arching um, branches, uh, very, very attractive looking in the landscape, especially in the background. This foreground, uh, you see standing water here, well, this is not typical of this site. Uh, we had like a three-inch rain uh, not long before that, so typically this is moist soil, but it's not wet soil. Um, uh, this is a planting on the north side of a house. If you wanted just to have some uh, close by the house, uh, they're very attractive in, in a setting like that. And once they get going, uh, they will pretty much choke everything else out, so they'll make a solid stand of ostrich ferns. Um, this is a case where um, the owner decided to plant underneath an apple tree. Well, the apple tree wasn't pruned, so it wasn't like one of these you see out in an orchard that's heavily pruned. Uh, and so there's quite a bit of shade there, which you can see, and there are some weeds in there as well, too, some maples and, and uh, brambles and whatnot, but they're doing pretty well there. And you could get, you know, a number of meals off such a small patch in, in a year's time. 
This is an example of uh, fiddleheads that were growing in excessive, uh, excessively drained soil, full sun, and quite windy. And uh, it, they just will not do well in a situation like that. Uh, they'll, probably, they'll probably wind up dying uh, or barely hanging on. Definitely you won't be able to harvest any fiddleheads from a patch like that. So uh, to recap a little bit here, planted ostrich ferns do best when uh, it's mimicking natural stands. And unfortunately, there are very few uh, what I call improved varieties. I suspect that these are varieties that were found out in nature and propagated. But one is called the king uh, that I've seen in reference uh, and have seen growing in Maine. And it's a very impressive fern. It's, it's a big fern. Um, it's, uh, it's going to produce large fiddleheads, and so that may be a good one for planting. And I suspect that we may see more of these uh, named varieties in, in the future. So planting tips. Uh, get the biggest planting stock that you can. Uh, remember that the little plants are going to take a long time to get established, and they'll be weaker competitors against weeds and whatnot. Uh, planting in the spring would be best. Give the plant a chance to get established. Uh, especially when it's cool. Um, and if you can get dormant stock, uh, so much the better with no ferns up whatsoever. Uh, they're able to withstand that uh, shock of uh, transplanting if you're digging them up with permission. Um, choose the correct site of soil, otherwise the planting really won't, uh, won't uh, be doing all that well. Um, in getting ready to, uh, uh, to plant the fiddleheads, you need to really eliminate the weeds in the given area. Um, the soil should be dug up, loosened up a little bit. And uh, when you're bearing uh, the plant, to put it into the ground so that the top of the crown is covered uh, by just a little bit, maybe an inch or two of soil, and that will encourage some more uh, rooting and uh, perhaps uh, some more uh, rhizome growth. To plant, uh, space the plants about two feet apart, and make sure that you water, and this is like any other uh, plant that you would put in, uh, you water it in to get rid of those uh, excessive air spaces around the plant so that the roots don't dry out. And afterwards, really make sure that you go back and manage the weeds. If you have it in your woods, um, it's a real easy thing to forget, I found. So make sure you go back and visit your, visit your fiddleheads and visit your ramps if you planted some ramps. So uh, go back and, and visit with them, uh, and they'll, they'll benefit from that. And maybe if you have uh, uh, understory plants, um, you know, saplings and things, maybe eliminate those so that you just have a, a higher overstory uh, up above. So for resources, uh, we have two fact sheets, facts on fiddleheads. Um, that is talking about food safety and some recipes. Um, ostrich fern fiddleheads is one I authored, and I'm talking more about the fern itself. Uh, uh, there is a... Um, there are videos embedded in both of those. Uh, one, uh, how to blanch fiddleheads, I believe, and facts on fiddleheads. And on ostrich fern fiddleheads, how to identify and how to harvest uh, with some nice close-up images again. So you can kind of go back and look at that. Um, the only fact sheet uh, I know uh, that's, that's really good on planting fiddleheads is one that was written uh, by the, um, uh, the good folks up in New Brunswick, uh, the um, agricultural folks, uh, entitled Home Garden Fiddleheads. Uh, you notice the second line isn't, uh, isn't uh, highlighted because uh, it has an underscore here, and that, that was lost when it's, uh, when it's underlined. So uh, that way you can find that a little bit easier. Or you could just search for Home Garden Fiddleheads New Brunswick, and it should pop right up if you do a search. Uh, in terms of uh, field guides, uh, there's one I like um, uh, quite a bit, and I'm not, uh, I'm not endorsing any one book, but it's one I found useful on and, and, and my uh, tree farm. It's Forest Plants of Central Ontario, and you may say, well, what's that got to do with Maine? But anyhow, a lot of the plants are the same, and it's got really good pictures. It also has uh, other uses for the plants, non-timber forest uh, uses, and that's by Chambers uh, uh, et al. There are uh, two other authors. And then Peterson Field Guide, simply entitled Ferns by uh, Cobb. Um, and then uh, I've got some time for questions. And then right after that, if you folks don't mind, it would be really helpful for me to do a post, uh, a post uh, program evaluation too. So why don't we take some questions and then we'll go on to those slides. Okay, David, did you go to the questions? tab because we've got 13 ready and waiting for you. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, so the first question, um, I reckon you'll address growing parameters, but I have a 65-acre woodland farm in southeast Ohio and a source of starts from northern Ohio and a connection with local restaurants. Looking forward to learning about growing sites, et cetera. So I'm hoping that, uh, that we covered that um, uh, in, in the program, and I, th I think probably, if not, that first slide has my contact information. Feel free to contact me so we could talk a little bit more about that. Uh, do these ferns grow in Texas? Um, I don't believe so. The distribution slide uh, did not show them in Texas, but maybe at the higher elevations uh, they, might be able to, uh, they might be able to grow there. Um, okay, uh, a question about other uh, ferns and their edibility. Um, I don't know. Um, our food safety people are saying, let's stick with ostrich fern fiddleheads. There are many wild plants that are edible out there, but our information is based on uh, research, so uh, we haven't done any research on, on the other ferns. Um, we know that bracken's bad, and the other ones, I, I honestly can't tell you. Um, the next question is, I have land in southeast Ohio. I have ferns all over the woods. Are they likely to be ostrich or some other type? Um, they, um, so I would refer you to the, uh, to the field guides on, on ferns. If, they, uh, if they're growing in an area that's conducive, like moist, uh, moist grounds or whatnot, they could be ostrich ferns. Uh, if you have questions about that, you know, give, me a, give me an email. Um, uh, what wild animals eat ostrich ferns? I have not seen ostrich fern fiddleheads to be a preferred and I say preferred food of animals. I have seen them uh, munched a little bit here and there, but I have never seen where they've gone in and eaten a whole bunch of them. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe that's a good thing, especially if you have a lot of deer pressure. Um, a question, do you mean not to harvest plants with crowns less than one inch in diameter? That's correct. Uh, the smaller ferns uh, just don't have the vigor to withstand harvest and uh, should be avoided. So they should be bigger than a quarter, a quarter or bigger. No pond water either, absolutely correct. Don't wash in pond water. Um, okay, thank you for uh, talking about food safety. How, success, how successful are fiddlehead ferns in North Carolina? Um, I can't tell you. Um, I would suspect that the higher elevations are going to do better. Um, the zones are three to six, and I think in North Carolina, boy, you're really getting out of that zone area. But in the northern areas, I know, for example, red spruce grows down there, and red spruces would be out of its, uh, air, uh, out of its comfort zone in North Carolina, but at the higher elevations, perhaps it could. Um, um, do bracken ferns and ostrich ferns grow in the same environment? Thankfully, not really. Uh, bracken ferns like really excessively well-drained soil. They grow by roadsides where it's really, really dry. Um, so you don't typically see them growing side by side, which is really, really great. Um, another question, is it possible to plant them where other wild ferns are growing and doing very well, or will there be competition issues? Uh, there will be competition issues, um, so you would want to get some control over the, over the other ferns uh, first before you introduce the, the ostrich ferns. But once their uh, ostrich ferns are going, they're going to handle themselves pretty well. Can you freeze fiddleheads? Absolutely. In our uh, fact sheet, uh, Facts on Fiddleheads, um, I think it's Kathy Savoy is showing uh, how to do that. And um, yeah, they freeze quite well. Have you heard of anyone, uh, again, uh, Christmas uh, fern fiddleheads, uh, another one, and uh, people do eat actually bracken ferns in, uh, in other cultures, in Korea, in Japan. We do not recommend eating them in Brazil. Uh, we don't recommend it. Uh, so, and I can't tell you about Christmas ferns. Um, commercial, um, commercial selling of fiddleheads. In Maine, we have uh, one producer who uh, goes through about 40,000 pounds a year. Um, has a packing line, uh, washes them, and then ships them, uh, airships them. Um, they probably go all across the United States. I suspect uh, other countries would be a, a large market, but I think there's plenty of market domestically. Um, so I would uh, entertain uh, a conversation with your potential buyer and just say, you know, this is what I have, and uh, just like you're marketing anything else and see if they're interested in buying them. Um, Deer, uh, a question about deer again. Uh, deer don't seem to be too big a problem. 
they don't really have too many pests. Um, one of the biggest problems is uh, that cold temperature. Remember the frost damage. Um, I've, they do have a disease called FOMA. It doesn't seem to be really widespread. Out of the probably hundreds of acres of fiddleheads I've seen, I've not seen too much problem from anything, which is really great. Can you transplant the old crowns? You can transplant crowns as long as they have some degree of vigor, but when they have this big hummock sticking up above the ground, um, and it doesn't, um, you know, you can kind of keep an eye on that fern. If it only has like two or three fiddlehead, uh, fiddleheads coming up with the ferns uh, later on, that's not a good candidate. It probably, probably should have maybe six or more fiddleheads um, and, or, or ferns to, uh, to constitute uh, good success for transplanting. Uh, don't know who else. Um, most of the ferns are not ostrich ferns, okay, and that's Ohio again. What kind of market do these have in Michigan? You know, my question to folks is like, do other people eat fiddleheads out there? Um, I know in, um, in Minnesota they eat them a little bit, um, but they don't seem to have quite the cachet that they do have in Maine. Um, our supermarkets all will have fiddleheads. Corner stores all have fiddleheads. So I think it's a big part of our culture, and so it may have to be cultivated in other states. Um, do they grow in Texas again? I, I don't think they're going to grow unless it's uh, at a higher elevation. Uh, the zones, USDA grow uh, zones from three to six, and Texas is largely is going to be outside of that, too warm in other words. Uh, do the ostrich ferns have any alle allelopathic effects on other woodland plants? Allelopathy is the ability to suppress the growth of other plants around, and I'm not aware that they do. Uh, that's a good area for study. And um, Let's see. Any other questions? Not that have come in. Oh, um, can you tell us about your Fiddlehead Festival? Okay, so the Fiddlehead Festival uh, is the first Saturday. Um, excuse me. It's when is it? <laughs> I'd have to go back to my slide here. I'm 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 on pressure here. So it's. Um, let's forget about the date. You can refer to the slide for the date on that. Um, it's. Um, it's uh, held at the University of Maine at Farmington, and uh, it's, uh, it features uh, local food vendors, uh, folks cooking fiddleheads. We have cooking demonstrations showing how to cook fiddleheads, um, a lot of other classes about local foods, uh, bread making and things like that, local musicians. Uh, it's a day-long event. It goes from about 9 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon, uh, held rain or shine uh, on the UMS campus in Farmington, Maine. And it's it's been a it's been a great great success, a lot of work and a lot of fun. Well, um, thank you all for participating in the post webinar survey. Hopefully, you all learned something and are looking forward to next spring um, when you get your delicious fiddleheads. Um, I just wanted to point out that the next webinar in our series is going to be on ramp ramps, so another something you can eat. Actually, we're, we're big on eating because we've got ramps, and then in the end of September we've got forest brews, which is mostly about making beer. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to join us again, and I just want to thank Mr. Fuller for guiding us through fiddleheads. I feel like I should have known more about them because I'm from Maine, but... I wasn't really a vegetables girl. Um, <laughs> someone just asked about CFEs, so I'll just remind you that um, we put the webinar up for a month. So if you or someone you know wants to watch them for CFE credits, they can do that for a month. And then after that, I send all the names of the people that watched for long enough to SAS. But um, if you watch today, I'll also send you the certificate so that you can just have that if you need to prove it to someone. Um, and you will automatically be sent slides and a recording of the presentation. So uh, great. That is all. And thank you all for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the webinar for today. We thank you for your participation and ask you to please disconnect your line.